Energy, continually transferred through an intricate network of circuits. From simple circuits and complex networks of them comes most of the electricity that supports our technological way of life. Electrical energy. We depend on delivery when and where we want it, and on a continual supply. Whole cities are fed this energy from wires that join them to the generators that produce the source of power. Circuits of great size keep electric energy flowing through city communities and small towns. And these larger circuits tie into smaller circuits that feed electric power to individual buildings. And within those buildings, energy is fed into the smaller circuits of individual electric devices and appliances. Producing light, heat, motion, sound. Electrical energy flowing through many small circuits is converted into many other forms of energy. In factories and offices, Electricity powers the machines that drive our industrial electronic civilization. Electricity flows into each of the machines through their internal circuits. Part of the small circuits in some electrical devices lead to still smaller circuits, micro circuits, where tiny currents of electricity flow along incredibly complex paths in the integrated circuits of computer chips. Electricity flowing through vast systems brings us the power we depend on. But regardless of the size of the system that brings us the power, they are all alike in three basic ways. One is, Electrons are involved. An electric current is a flow of electrons, and the electrons that make up a current are in a metal wire. In every metal, there is a vast supply of free electrons that can be set in motion in the same general direction. All they need is a steady push, the second requirement. The push may come from a transformation of energy at a dam. The kinetic energy of falling water is converted to electrical energy in a generator. Or the push may come from conversions of chemical energy into electrical energy in a dry cell. But whether it's a small push from a single dry cell or a great push from a bank of giant generators, the push itself is the same always the result of a conversion of one form of energy into electrical energy. And so we have two of the three requirements for electricity to flow. The push that moves the electrons and the wires that are the source of electrons. Now, all we need is a complete circuit, an unbroken electronic path from the source of the push to the places where the electric power is used and then back again. Cables laid underground or strung above ground contain wires that carry the current away from the generating stations, and the earth itself can act as a return wire. A source of electrons, a push, and a complete circuit, and we have an electric current. A flow of electrons in a circuit that may be so tiny that thousands of such circuits could fit on a fingertip, or so large that one might stretch to the horizon and beyond. Break the circuit and the flow stops. Complete it and the current flows again. But though electrons are flowing in the same general direction, those that enter a circuit at a generator or battery are not the same ones that return to it. Think of a wire as a hollow tube and the electrons as ball bearings being moved along by the push of a thumb. The individual electrons don't move very fast along the wire 
but the push is being transmitted almost instantaneously. The transmission of the push is the result of negative electrons repelling other negative electrons. And the result of the steady push is the steady flow of electrons, an electric current. So when the three conditions are met, current can flow. Current flow is measured in amperes, or amps, and the push that moves the current is measured in volts. But another okay. factor has to be considered. For electrons to move through a wire, those electrons have to overcome the attraction from the nuclei of atoms the electrons are part of. This attraction produces what we call electrical resistance. As resistance causes electrons to lose energy, part of their kinetic energy is converted to heat. Resistance partly depends on how far a current has to travel. A very long circuit needs very high voltages to push its current through great lengths of wire. Transformers are needed to increase the push produced by generators for large circuits. Transformers may increase the electric force to hundreds of thousands of volts before a current begins a long journey. This makes sure resistance won't remove too much of a current's energy before it reaches its destination. Resistance also depends on the kind of material the electrons flow through. Although aluminum is not as good a conductor as copper or silver, it's lighter in weight and lower in cost. So, aluminum wires are most often used for overhead cables. The greater heat produced by aluminum's resistance to the current safely passes into the air. Once current has traveled by means of its long circuit to the places where it will be used, transformers step down the voltage for use in smaller circuits. Every use of electricity involves some resistance. The heat effect of resistance is most noticeable in a light bulb. The filament is so intensely heated as current passes through it that it glows. Resistance is high partly because the filament is very thin. The smaller the cross section of a wire, the higher the resistance. Heat is expected in a light bulb, but dangerous in wires inside buildings. Fuses break circuits when wires overheat. Circuit breakers have a similar function. Because copper offers less resistance than aluminum, it's usually used in interior wiring. Copper is also used in motor windings. Excess heat could burn out a motor. Although circuits vary in complexity and size, there are just two kinds of them, series and parallel. At home, for instance, a main circuit breaker may pop open, cutting off all electricity. This is the result of series wiring. Devices are connected along one single pathway. Series wiring is always used in switches and circuit breakers. But devices that use electricity along a circuit are connected with parallel wiring. Current will stop flowing through a lamp when the bulb burns out, but keep flowing through the stereo plugged into the same circuit. Parallel wiring gives electricity alternate paths. Should one of the paths fail, current will still continue to flow in the circuit. Automobile headlights are another illustration of the advantage of parallel wiring. Headlights on one side can still be on, even when the ones on the other side have burned out. Because the circuit from the source of the voltage branches, each headlight has an independent, separate pathway. If there is a break between the voltage source and the place where the circuits branch, then both lights would go out. But if one light burns out, current will stop flowing through that branch only, but continue in the alternate branch of the circuit. Like electrical devices, sources of electricity can also be connected in series or in parallel. For example, a battery is usually connected in series. This adds the dry cell's voltages together. But to increase current instead of voltage, extra generators are added in parallel. Most circuits contain combinations of series and parallel connections. In many electronic devices, circuits are printed using copper instead of ink. Tiny transformers step down voltage to the much lower levels these circuits require for carrying current. 
Transistors act as switches. Printed circuits in many devices conduct currents to still smaller circuits etched onto silicon chips. Silicon is a semiconductor. But impurities, carefully added to thin slices of pure silicon, let it carry tiny currents along precise microscopic paths. On each of these disks, each tiny chip may contain thousands of series and parallel circuits. Circuits correspond to problem-solving choices, differences in voltage and current to information. The speed at which current can travel in the short paths on these chips makes possible thousands of changes in less than a second. Paths in some microchips may be so narrow that only one or two electrons can squeeze through at the same time. Such paths carry very small currents that can move very rapidly. The microchip has created an electronic revolution in which new knowledge is being applied every day. The remarkable advances that are taking place may allow tiny lasers to fire photons instead of electrons that will flow along paths of transparent crystal. And organic molecules called biochips may be synthesized that can control the movement of electricity. All these marvels of miniaturization still depend on the three basic elements that allow current to flow in either series or parallel circuits. An electric push, a source of free electrons, and a complete circuit. So current is put in motion by the voltage produced at generating stations and delivered to the places where it's used. And we pay for this delivery of energy on the basis of the work required to keep the current flowing. Voltage times the current times the amount of time the current is used leads us to the familiar unit of work, the kilowatt hour. But when many devices that require large amounts of current are put into use at the same time, more work may be demanded of circuits than they can deliver. Unless more generators can quickly be tied into the system, brownouts may occur. Or blackouts as the great circuits break and electricity stops flowing. Then we are most aware of the role of electricity in our lives of how important it is to keep electric current flowing through all the simple and complex circuits that are the foundation of our electric civilization.